Hi. Now in this video, what I want to do is show you how we can find the nth roots of unity and some geometrical facts that occur with this. But to do this, what I want to do is start with an easy example, z cubed equals 1. So z would be equal to the cube root of 1. And we've done questions like this in the past. We've done it by this method, but it, there's a drawback with this. So I'll show you. We've let, say, z equal x plus iy. So therefore, x plus i y, all cubed, z cubed in other words, must equal 1. And what we've done is we've expanded this and compared real parts and imaginary parts, solved the corresponding equations for x and y, and substitute them back into here to give us z. One of those answers is the obvious one, z would equal 1. But the other two answers would form a complex conjugate pair. So we've discussed this kind of idea in the past, but what happens if, say, for instance, I had z to the power 10 equals 1? z would be equal to the 10th root of 1. There'll be 10 solutions. I'd have to do x plus i, y to the power 10 equals 1. Imagine expanding that and comparing real and imaginary parts. It'd be a nightmare. So there must be a better method, and there is, okay? And that's the purpose of this tutorial. What I wanted to show you is how we can go about finding the nth roots of 1. And I'm going to use the example z cubed equals 1 to demonstrate this, but the method would equally apply to any other roots of 1. Now, if we were to take a complex number z and write it in mod arg form, in other words, r cos theta plus i sine theta, or you could write it in exponential form, that would be r e to the i theta. Now suppose I was to represent the real number 1 on an argon diagram. If I was to draw my axis, let's say we have a real axis, something like this, and we'll take our imaginary axis, we'll come down here. So that's our imaginary axis. Then the real number 1 would be represented something like this. We'll have that, put an arrow on there, and that would go to 1 there. So if I was to represent 1 in this particular form here, R would be 1. The arg of theta, well that would be 0 radians. So I can just write 1 here as being the cosine of 0 radians plus I sine 0 radians. Now, Okay, I've got it in this form, but I could add any multiple of 2 pi to the arg and I would still get the same result. It would still come to 1. So what we do is we rewrite this as the cosine of 0 plus, say, 2k pi, where k is an integer. And for the imaginary part, I write it as i sine of 0 plus 2k pi. Okay, so hopefully you got the 2k pi bit, okay? It's just saying that we could go from here and do any multiple of 2 pi and it will keep bringing us back to this particular place. Okay, well, we could simplify this. We don't need that zero anymore. So we could just write this then as the cosine of 2k pi radians plus i sine of 2k pi radians. Now, if we use de Marva's theorem, okay, we know that z would be equal to the cube root of 1. All right. And, in other words, that's going to be 1 to the power 1 third. So we've got to 
write all of this then to the power of third. So what we've got then is that this is equal to the cosine, let's put some square brackets there, the cosine of 2k pi plus i sine 2k pi and all of this lot is raised to the power one third. Now by De Marva's theorem we know that we can bring this power down to the arg. We can multiply it with the arg here. So in other words what we get is the cosine of 2k pi over 3. And for this result it'll be i sine of 2k pi over 3. Now I've used the mod arg form to get to this result here. You might not want to use the mod arg form. There's other ways that you could do this. You could use the exponential form. So I'll just quickly bring you up to speed on that because it will change from one textbook to the other or from one teacher to the other. So we'll have a different method. If I was to use the exponential form then in place of this result here for z cubed, let's just put down we've got z cubed would equal r. r is the modulus which is 1, okay so we've just got 1, we can leave that off and then it'll be e to the power i and then for theta, theta is the arg, we can represent it as 2k pi, so just put that in brackets, 2k pi. Alright, so when we take the cube root, we've got this is now raised to the power of third. So what we've got is therefore z would equal, and we'll put this in square brackets here, it would be e to the power i 2k pi, and all of this would be to the power one third. And if I'm doing something like this with powers, then I just multiply the power by the third. And what we end up with is an equivalent statement to what we've got here. That is that z equals e to the power i 2k pi over 3. Okay, so we've got the mod arg form or the exponential form. It's totally up to you which version you want to work with. So where do we go from here? Well, we know that when k equals 0, let's just write it down here. When k equals 0, we end up with the cosine of 0 plus i sine 0. In other words, what we had up here, which is 1. This result here on the argon diagram. So we'll just write then that z equals 1. Now suppose we take another integer value for k. Let's say when k equals 1. Okay, now when k equals 1, what do we have this time? Well, z would be equal to the cosine of 2 pi over 3, or 2 thirds pi, and here we'd have plus i sine of 2 thirds pi. So let's just write that in. We've got the cosine of 2 pi over 3, 2 thirds pi, plus i sine, again, of 2 thirds pi. Now what does this result in? Well, the cosine of 2 thirds pi is minus a half, so we get minus a half, and then the sine of 2 pi over 3, 2 thirds pi, is positive root 3 over 2, so we've got plus i root 3 over 2. And we could represent this on our argon diagram. We've got that the arg is 2 thirds pi, and the modulus is 1. So it's going to look something like this. I'll just put an arrow on that one. Okay. Now what happens if I put, say, k 
equals 2 through here? Well, I get the cosine of 4 thirds pi plus i sine 4 thirds pi. But for complex numbers, we like the arg to lie between minus pi, it's got to be greater than minus pi, but less than or equal to pi. So 4 thirds pi does go out of that range. So what we need to do is take k to equal minus 1. So when k equals minus 1, okay, what do we get? Well, we end up with z equaling the cosine of minus 2 thirds pi, which is in range, okay, minus 2 thirds pi. And then plus i sine of minus 2 thirds pi. And when we work this one out, you end up with minus a half, and then minus i root 3 over 2. And if we were to plot this on the argon diagram, what we would find is that the arg is minus 2 thirds pi. Now remember this angle in here was 2 thirds pi, so it's just going to be turning in the clockwise direction by the same amount. So it's going to look something like this. We'll just mark that on with an arrow like so. Now what we've got here is the three roots. I might as well call them say z1, z2 and z3. And you'll notice that they're all equally spaced. If I mark in this angle in here, this angle in here and this angle round here, each of those angles, let's just say we call them alpha, then alpha is equal to 2 thirds pi radians. And also, because they have exactly the same modulus, one unit, they lie on a circle of radius one unit. Let's just put that in here, that we've got a circle of radius one unit, so r equals 1. Now we can write these solutions in then as z1 for this first one, let's just write that in as z1, and then the second solution we got here in blue was z2 say, and then the third solution, third root, was z3. Now, when I got these roots here, I took k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals minus 1. I could have taken 0, 1 and 2, but we don't tend to do this because although it would have given us the same result, because if k equal 2, we would have had the cosine of 4 thirds pi plus i sine 4 thirds pi. It would have taken us to exactly the same place as we've got here. But when we express a complex number in mod arg form, the arg has to be greater than minus pi, but less than or equal to pi. So 4 thirds pi would have been out of range. But, as I say, it would have given us exactly the same result though. Now, if you were using the exponential form of representing the complex number z, okay, then we would still take our values of k as being 0. It would have given us an arg of 0, leading us to 1. And then if k equaled 1, we would have had an arg of 2 thirds pi. It would have taken us to this point here. And it has a mod of 1, and if we had taken k to be minus 1, it would have given us an arg of minus 2 thirds pi, no different to what we've got here, and we would have gone round that way, and the mod would have been 1. So, it's up to you again which system that you use. Now, some interesting results follow from 
this particular result, the nth roots of 1. Remember, we're just looking at the cube roots of 1. But if we take the first complex number moving in an anti-clockwise sense away from the 1, and in this example it's z2, then if we let z2 equal, say, omega, just write that in, then if we were to work out what z2 was squared, then you could either just square this result, or you could use the result that if you're looking at the modulus of a complex number, this complex number multiplied by itself again, then all we do is we multiply the individual moduli together. So in other words, it will just be 1 times 1, which is 1. So we've got a complex number with a modulus of 1. And remember that if you square a complex number, you would add the args together. So you've got the cosine, well the arg I should say is 2 thirds pi, and if you were to double that, add it to itself again, you're going to get an arg of 4 thirds pi. And an arg of 4 thirds pi takes us round to here, which is the same as minus 2 thirds pi. Can you see that just by squaring z2, we're getting z3. So z3 turns out to be omega squared, or z2 squared. So I'll just highlight this result, OK? Just put a box around it. And you'll find similar results like this when you do further roots of 1, OK? Now, another result that's worth looking at is the fact that Z3 is the complex conjugate of Z2, OK? So we get our results occurring, remember, in a complex conjugate pair. So Z2 was omega, so we've got that omega, if I take the complex conjugate of it, it equaled omega squared in this example. OK? So, well worth mentioning that one. Now, another important fact that works with this is that if we were to consider, say, these complex numbers that I've drawn as vectors, then if I was to draw z1, OK, let's just put this down here, z1, like that, OK? That's going to be one unit that way and follow it with z2. Remember, that's one unit, and it's going to look something like that. OK. We'll say that's omega now. And if I follow it with z3, which we've just seen is omega squared, all right, it forms a closed triangle, OK? A closed polygon, if you like. Only the polygon here is a triangle. So what we've got is this result. I'll just say also, OK? This result is that if we add these together, these complex numbers together, we've got that 1 plus omega plus omega squared equals 0. And this result shows up a lot when you're dealing with the nth roots of 1, as I'll show you in another video. You can check this out even just by looking at our results here. If you were to add the three complex numbers up, you'll see we've got 1 plus minus a half plus minus a half, well that's 0, and then these two cancel out to 0. OK, so I hope that's giving you an idea then how we can go about finding the cube roots of 1 in this particular instance. And we can take this method further just by finding, say, the fourth roots of 1, similar method, fifth roots of 1, and so on, all the way down to the nth roots of 1.